Again, thanks for coming. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Samantha Earp. Samantha is the executive director at Harvard X, Harvard University's wide strategic initiative, uh, focuses on innovation and research in online learning. She manages the organization that produces Harvard X online learning experiences and works with faculty and university leadership on, strategic, on strategies for faculty engagement, innovative pedagogy, and sustainability. We're really pleased to have Samantha here today. Please help me in welcoming her to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here. And before we get started, I would just like to um, attempt to say that uh, dans l'esprit bilingue de ce forum, ça me fait très plaisir d'être ici avec vous. Et let's see what happens, all right? <laughs> a former French teacher always enjoys a chance to um, revisit her former occupation. So uh, I am here, as um, Richard kindly said, representing Harvard X which is a relatively young university initiative at Harvard and relatively unique in that it is a university-wide initiative that was born um, not quite two and a half years ago in combination with the announcement and formation of edX, which is a partnership between MIT and Harvard and a growing number of institutions around the world to provide open source platform and services for open and online education. And I will be speaking primarily about the Harvard X portion of this work, um, but it's possible I might also be able to answer questions about edX as it pertains to Harvard's participation in, in edX. And so just a little bit of background. Um, in fall of 2011, Harvard was celebrating its 375th anniversary. And a group of senior faculty and university leaders were imagining what education would look like, not only at Harvard, but around the world in, um, when Harvard would reach its 400th anniversary. So there were a number of conversations about what the future might look like in the Harvard context. And one of the things that was um, a unanimous view was that Harvard needed to engage much more deeply in um, learning and in what the future of learning like, might look like, not only for the students at Harvard, but for the way we connect around the world. So that led to a couple of university initiatives. Um, the first one that was announced was the Har Harvard Initiative for Learning and Teaching, which we call HILT, and that also simultaneously led to conversations with MIT, which led to the formation of edX, and to um, what is now an organization called Harvard X and the initiative that um, brings online courses to the world. So Harvard X has um, three goals. And let's, there we go. So Harvard X has three goals, and I will just talk you through them. And um, I'm often asked, and we are often asked, which one is the primary goal? And the difficult answer is that they are all <laughs> the primary goal. And so I want to start with that frame a little bit um, and because you'll understand why as I, as I talk through what we've been doing. So um, our first goal is one that I'm sure is near and dear to the hearts of all of you who are here, which is um, global access to education, which we refer to in our shorthand way as REACH, um, ways to connect with learners around the world ways to bring learners around the world into the Harvard classroom, whether that's at the undergraduate level or professional executive education or graduate degrees. And so that's most easily uh, manifested in the courses and, and learning modules that are now available to the world through the edX platform for the most part. Our second um, major goal is research, using the opportunity that we have now through the courses and modules that we have uh, made available, and really using that to participate in a, a conversation across education about what it means to learn online, what it is that we can glean from um, open online educational settings, and what those might help us learn about residential education or hybrid and blended education which leads to the third point, which is about residential, um, primarily what we call residential education, education that takes place 
on campus, most traditionally the undergraduate uh, residential degrees, but also the graduate degrees um, that and professional uh, learning experiences that have at least some face-to-face -face anchor on campus, even though the, the exact format of those might be changing. And then the principles that we have that drive our governance of this and the way we approach this across th these three goals is that we want to focus our efforts on activities that have impact, that have uh, a certain level of quality, that represent the breadth of the disciplines and the intellectual engagement and innovation that um, resides in the schools and in the faculty and in the students and at the level of rigor that um, we think of as being associated with a Harvard education. And in terms of how we um, operationalize that, we focus on experimentation, we spoke, focus on iteration, um, not waiting until we have the perfect thing, but trying something and see what we can learn from it and move forward. Recirculation back to campus and back to um, projects that we work on. And most especially as, as sort of um, an artifact of Harvard culture collaboration, Harvard is an institution that is made up of multiple schools which have a high degree of independence. And one of the challenges and opportunities of a university-wide initiative is how to make those very decentralized schools and the people who work within them and the richness of opportunity that they represent connect together and coordinate together in an ongoing way. A little bit of um, basic data about Harvard X. We um, launched our first two courses in fall of 2012 in public health and computer science, um, working with three faculty. Since that time, we have now broadened our support to 66 faculty across Harvard. And um, just go back to this. And we have produced 45 open courses and modules. Um, terminology varies by institution, but for us, courses is a unit that is mostly akin to what you see in a traditional semester, and modules are shorter learning units spanning anywhere from four to eight weeks. We have many more faculty beyond these 66, but these are the primary faculty who have given extraordinary amounts of their time to lead projects that bring courses and modules um, online. We've also produced six SPOCs, and that's a particular acronym that has um, come out of the MOOC world, small private online courses. In our case, what that means is that we have produced open courses that have an enrollment cap, but that have open application, so that anyone from around the world could apply to participate, and then the faculty member and the, the instructional staff have a selection process, and um, then the course takes place with the people who are selected to participate. And for the most part, the reason that was done was to enable a particular kind of pedagogical experiment, and in some cases, to connect what happens in the SPOC to a course on campus that is running at the same time. We've taken, we've drawn from a couple of the SPOCs and several of the open courses and modules to have formal projects blending the materials and the activities in the open learning experiences and tie them back in a deeply integrated way with on-campus courses, primarily at the undergraduate level, um, with two also being in professional education in the School of Public Health. As an organization, we support faculty in doing up to three versions or iterations of a course or module with us. And we are now, this number is a little bit old, that's one of the challenges of submitting things ahead of time, but we now have 37 active projects that we're working on with faculty, which will result in us publishing course, uh, those courses and modules through the end of the spring. Um, since the inception of edX, we've had about one and a half million registrations. That number goes up. And there's some, um, some healthy debate about what those numbers even mean, and we will come back to that. Um, roughly half of the registrations on edX, um, but primarily because we've invested so much institutionally in publishing these courses and modules that we have many more to, to choose from. A large... Um, 
majority, I think this number is actually a little low at this point, of our registrants are from outside of the United States, and, and roughly equivalent number have at least a bachelor's degree. So it's not exactly the same population as our undergraduate students, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as well. And we've had roughly 100,000 honor certificates earned, which is what a participant gains at the end of the course or module after having uh, satisfied whatever um, threshold the faculty member has identified as passing the learning experience. So just want to show you um, a global snapshot. This is from our website, harvardx.harvard.edu. This is a service that our research team developed last year that allows anybody in the world, you can do this now if you're on wireless, to look at the data from um, many, not all, but many of the courses and modules that have been uh, made available in open fashion um, one or more times. And there are a couple of metrics there that are global across the program. And then, let's see, you can't actually see it on this, but each map has a little drop down um, menu, and then you can look at uh, certain types of data by course as well. So this is a tool that we are continually revising and looking at different ways that we can parse this information and make it publicly browsable um, as we continue to learn from what we're doing. So I'd like to give you a few snapshots of some of the learning experiences that we have worked with faculty on over the last two and a half years. And I'll start with the one that um, has, has been by far uh, attracted the largest number of participants by far. And hopefully as I go through these, you will hear some echoes of the three goals that, that I talked to you about at the beginning. At this point, CS50X has attracted over half a million uh, registrants. It, has, it was first made available, as I mentioned, in fall of 2012. It is one of our few courses that in the second time around, we have even more than we did the first time. Um, the trend is generally that the enrollment drops anywhere from 30 to 50 percent. And in the second iteration, the faculty member, David Malin, who has been the lead not only of the Harvard X project, but an extraordinary reimagining of this course in its on-campus residential version, has transformed this into an on-demand, self-paced course. So learners can start at any time, they can take as long as they want, and when they have earned their certificate, they can get that as well. And this has really been um, an amazing example of how taking a very powerful learning experience that is available to Harvard undergrads, um, and by the way, it is now the, the undergraduate course in Harvard College with the largest enrollment as of this year, and then making um, an experience connected to that online, to that residential, rather, course available to the world. It's also given us a, um, opportunities to think about how we broaden the reach and so this year, um, Professor Malin and his team have been collaborating with a nonprofit called Launch Code, which provides uh, job training to um, students and people who are out of jobs in communities around the United States using this curriculum as a way for them to gain the skills that, that, that they need. Um, I'll make one quick mention of the Division of Continuing Education at Harvard, which um, actually has been doing online education for quite some time, and it's not widely known that they've been doing this. Um, Harvard X was not the origin of online learning at Harvard. The Division of Continuing Education has been engaged in this for 15 years. And so what we are trying to do is partner with them and um, learn how we can connect what we're doing in the open space with what is also happening in continuing education space, both for credit and, and non-credit options. Um, moving on to a course that has not been online prior to its existence in Harvard X, Global Health, which uh, brings a biosocial perspective to many issues around global health. This has been an opportunity to bring the case method into um, an open um, online learning experience and see what that looks like when you have um, thousands of people trying to engage. What it, what, one of the best outcomes, which is one I'm sure has been true for many of your initiatives, is groups of learners, often professionals in, around the world, using these learning experiences and the materials in them as the basis for local study groups and um, for local professional development activities. 
Innovation in Healthcare was our first course involving a faculty member from the Harvard Business School, um, Reggie Hertzlinger. And this course actually had two modes. It had a MOOC and it had a SPOC. And the SPOC was application. And those who were accepted from all over the world into the SPOC were able to participate in a coached activity developing a business plan. And we worked with a local startup to match teams together. And then the professor brought in venture capitalists to judge the competition. So it's an example of how we're looking at ways to not only put um, our courses and modules online broadly, but have connecting opportunities that allow us to further engage with learners. Copyright X, um, which is led by Professor Terry Fisher of the Harvard Law School, was really um, one of our earliest opportunities to think beyond the traditional MOOC. And I should say, and I'm sure many of you will agree, that MOOC is a, a word that is a blessing and a curse. <laughs> um, it has gotten lots of attention. It has brought a lot of good conversation to a field that is already quite um, mature and has a lot of research behind it. And when we were first talking um, at Harvard, we already knew that we didn't want to limit our sites to MOOCs. And Professor Fisher was the first faculty member who um, took a slightly different path to implementing an open course. This is a SPOC. It was first offered in the spring of 2013. It was offered again in spring of 2014, and it will have its final iteration with HarvardX this coming spring. And this used the method I described, which was to have open application from participants around the world. The teaching staff selected 500 the first time around. And then they ran this um, open course concurrently with the Harvard Law School seminar. And they used um, live events for the Harvard Law School seminar to invite in the participants in the MOOC several times during the semester and have a dialogue that engaged not only learners at Harvard, but the learners around the world. And um, in doing so, really enriched the perspectives and the, the intellectual contributions around the topics that were being studied in, in the particular field of law focusing on copyright. In the second iteration, um, having found that that was a great success, Professor Fisher and his team then identified satellites all around the world on four continents that um, held simultaneous study groups. There were people who volunteered to be the local leaders and to stay in touch with Professor Fisher and his team. And they did the curriculum together at the same time. And people who completed that curriculum in the satellite locations were also awarded a HarvardX certificate at the end. And that is something that Professor Fisher and the law school plan to continue as an ongoing activity. Um, just two more briefly. Um, Poetry X is a fantastic example of our aspirations in the disciplines that we bring to the online learning space. Um, it's a little bit of a cliche that most of the online, in, in the popular imagination, shall I say quickly, um, that the, the most effective online education is in computer science and things that can be automated. And that's something that we certainly don't believe, and I imagine most of you do not either. But we needed to begin experimentation on what could we actually do in humanities courses in this kind of form. And not just in the form of bringing content online, but having learners engage in ways that are most effective in um, interpretive situations and um, humanities classrooms in particular. So Professor Elisa New was um, a faculty member we worked with on developing smaller modules around um, epochs in the history of American poetry. And she um, launched two modules between um, six and eight weeks. And she was really looking at two strategies to find out how to, to engage learners further beyond um, traditional discussion boards and, and video. And so we worked with her and developed a tool that would allow learners to contribute annotations for their own use 
and for um, viewing by others in the course and using those as a basis for discussion. And also, um, we hope in the future as a way to do some data mining that allows us to understand what topics the students are connecting in and what questions they might have. And we've um, been using that tool as well in other humanities courses and expect to do so further in the residential courses that are similar to this and we hope in, in future HarvardX courses as well. This is also one of our earliest examples of um, starting with the kernel of what we have with the HarvardX module and looking for partnerships of how the learning experience or the content associated with the learning experience can, can be useful in other settings. So as many of you are doing as well, this has been the basis for a partnership for developing high school curricula, working within what in the United States are called uh, common core standards and in a partnership with our Graduate School of Education on how um, Professor Niu and, and her colleagues can train high school teachers on the use of the materials and the curricula that have been provided through Poetry X. And then the final example that I'll give of one of our um, projects is Justice X. Professor Michael Sandel actually was one of the early innovators at Harvard in taking um, his Harvard curriculum to a global audience. There was a partnership with the television station WGBH a few years back at Harvard where they came in and they filmed Professor Sandel in um, Sanders Theater. And um, sorry, I'm just realizing you're not caught up with me. Um, filmed him in Sanders Theater. Here we go. And um, you can see the picture here. This is an iconic Harvard classroom. It's, it's an auditorium and it's um, everything you might expect with kind of an old old institution, ivy-covered institution, lots of wood. It's where um, major addresses are held when the president gives her annual address at Harvard. And uh, several of the largest courses at Harvard are held in this, in this auditorium. And Professor Sandel gives this course that has become quite well known um, at Harvard. And through the efforts of the partnership a few years back with WGBH, it became a broadcast that was available around the world and was a particular hit in, in Asia. And so that meant that we had a body of material and we had a professor with somewhat of an experience in um, open content. And we wanted to transform that into an actual open learning experience. So working with him to devise um, a path for learners on how they would interact with the content and have the opportunity to discuss what are really quite challenging ethical and moral issues that don't lend themselves especially well to massive scale and to traditional tools. So this has given us a way to learn more about how we might allow learners around the world to have the kind of um, connected discussion that can often get buried in a very large discussion board. So we're looking at asynchronous peer feedback tools that will allow us to match students together and have them proceed through a set of questions in a dialogue that will then um, allow them to participate in a larger synchronous um, activity. And this is also one of our um, earliest efforts in thinking about how we bring multilingual experiences to the open space. Um, we have begun with transcripts. We are looking at ways that we might provide um, multiple language synchronous discussion sessions at various points throughout um, the learner experience as well. So um, two years since our first courses were launched, um, that feels like a very short time in some ways and feels like a very long way to cover in others. And I'm going to start with the um, question that we always get asked, and I imagine any of you get asked if you are doing something that people think of as a MOOC, is so few people finish. You must consider this an abject failure. Why do you want to do this? And this is a question that our research team has spent a lot of time thinking about. And I, I should just add that our, our research efforts really got started um, a year ago, so um, don't quite have the lifespan of the course development. And the conc early conclusions after a year, they've spent really trying to understand the basic landscape of who the learners are, is that completion is a poor measure of success in this setting. 
with MOOCs and, and the open um, courses and modules. Learners are there for various reasons. They have different profiles. They engage in ways that have meaning to them. Some of them are tourists. If um, I, I'm personally curious what the percentage is of people like us who enroll in dozens of these MOOCs, uh, never to complete even an activity, often in many cases. And there probably aren't that many of us to skew the results, but, but you, you get the point. And assuming that they are there for the same reasons and that the same metrics apply is, I think, increasingly obvious now. But for people who do not work in this space, it, it remains the first question that, that we all hear. So that then leads to um, where do we go with that? And for the perspective of what Harvard is doing, um, we don't consider a MOOC the final goal of what we're doing, and we don't consider MOOCs to be a single entity in and of itself any more than we consider there to be a single kind of faculty member. Um, people have different perspectives, they work in different contexts, and when we work with faculty in Harvard X to bring, um, to bring their vision of a learning experience into uh, the online mode, we have a set of choices. We're not looking to apply a template. Um, our goals are to do something that we think pushes the boundaries not only of that discipline but of the faculty member's experience and gives us an opportunity to learn something useful and build on that. And so speaking to the theme of institutional change that I believe is kind of the guiding um, framework for today, that this particular approach works very well for us in the context of thinking about what learning will look like at Harvard over the next 25 years and beyond. And it gives us some clear paths to pursue on thinking about the connections between what we do in the open online space what we do in the research space, and then how we connect that all together on campus in sort of a, a virtuous um, circle. And that in doing so, we really place the primary focus on learning and on um, teachers, both current teachers and teachers who are in formation and will become the faculty of tomorrow and the next couple of decades, and not leading with technology. Um, Harvard is in the middle of a major campaign. This is something that American institutions do to fund their activities. And one of the major campaign themes is leading and learning. And um, often, I think we're, we are seen as leading with technology, and we really want to, to lead with learning. A couple of research highlights, um, and um, we'll just move to that. So as I was saying a moment ago, um, the enrollees in these online, open online courses and modules have diverse motivations and expectations. And if you go to the Harvard X website on the research area, you will find a report that um, presents our research team's findings of the kinds of learners who have been engaged with us um, in our first year. And they represent lifelong learners, um, what the research team calls instrumental learners. We've seen this particularly in courses related to the professional schools and especially in the field of public health, where there's a higher proportion of enrollees and learners who remain with the courses and modules who are there for very powerful reasons related to their professions and their avocations. We have high school students. We have homeschool students, so students who are following um, not the standardized curriculum of their county or state. And then we have a number of people who are there for professional reasons it's supporting their initiatives, as, as we all do. Um, even though we think we can't draw particular conclusions just yet, and that we, are, uh, we need to understand much more deeply who these learners are, we do think that the MOOC movement and um, understanding MOOC expansively here does have ongoing implications for higher education. Um, our researchers are now focused um, on how we identify the learners within our MOOC populations who are um, akin to our residential learners and how can we study them as a population and learn what um, from that begin to frame some hypotheses about what this means for higher education. Um, and, and in terms of framing hypotheses, this is not just for the curricula um, the, itself. It's for the policies that go around, along with um, this new mode of learning. 
For example, I mentioned Computer Science 50 as one of the, um, I think, large, well, certainly the largest that we have, but it continues to draw uh, learners from around the world. So you can imagine over time that a, a, an incoming freshman at Harvard will someday have taken Computer Science 50 or the equivalent course on a different platform. Do they have to take that course all over again in their undergraduate degree? Um, do we genuinely believe that what happens in the residential setting in that particular course is superior, and if so, why? These are really intricate and complex policy questions that we think will necessarily have an impact on where higher education is going. And as, as our research teams do that, we do think that we can actually start to draw some comparisons between learning, assuming that we have analogous populations between what happens in open online settings and what happens in on-campus courses. And so framing out a research agenda around that and um, implementing studies is one of our, our research team's top priorities for the coming year. And one of the things I should draw out here is that in, in designing a university-wide initiative, it's actually an extraordinary effort for us to have such a new organization that is actually quite large as these things go, with uh, emphases not only on instructional design and development, but also research. And um, what makes this all worthwhile? So certainly we feel like the early efforts in research are advancing our foundational understanding of what is happening in, in our MOOCs and in open online education. And I should just um, indicate here one of the early successes from that point of view and from the point of view of collaboration is that the Harvard X researchers work very closely on an ongoing basis with our colleagues um, just down the street at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And there are several joint research efforts that have come out of that collaboration and you can find some of those working papers and findings on, on the website. I mentioned before that um, as we work with campus partners on blended learning, this gives us not only an opportunity for specific courses and to have um, new materials and approaches for those courses, but to broaden the campus conversation about blended and hybrid learning. Certainly, as you all know from your activities, we are, we are bringing a really rich and robust set of learning experiences to the broader world, which not only benefits those populations, but we believe benefits our learners on campus to have new ways to engage outside the ivy-covered walls of our institutions. And then one of the, the most important um, outcomes for us, and we hope it will be a, a, an ongoing um, finding, is that through all this work, through the research, through the instructional development and delivery, we are providing, in the case of Harvard, a new space and a, new, uh, a safe space, really, for faculty to rethink their teaching on campus and to participate in the conversation about what this means for higher education. To a person, I mentioned there were 66 faculty we've supported so far. To a person, those faculty will tell you that this has been one of the hardest things they've done that it was far more work than they could have ever imagined and it's probably a good thing we didn't give them an idea of the hours it would take and that it has been one of, one of the most transformational, if not the most transformational experience in their careers as teachers and that it has fundamentally transformed the way they think about their teaching on campus. That sounds like hype, it's not. <laughs> That's, those are real reports. There are many um, challenges and there are many difficulties from small scale operational things to really um, complex policies around compensation and workload as well as the curricular issues that I mentioned. But that, that is a very powerful outcome for us and it is uh, reflective of a real change at Harvard in terms of having an ongoing camp campus conversation around learning and around teaching. So right after the conversation about this couldn't possibly be a success because nobody ever finishes, um, the next question is always there's, this couldn't possibly be a success because how in the world are you going to pay for all this? And um, that's a very good question. It's one that keeps me up at night as the person who has to make sure we 
have the funding to keep supporting faculty and to keep developing these courses. Um, we really have a couple of ideas right now of where we think this is going to go. And as our vice provost for advances in learning is fond of saying, um, free is not a sustainability model. And that's a tough thing to say, especially if you believe in open, online, and free learning experiences, and we do. So what we are doing right now for HarborDex is looking at what else we might do in addition to the open online learning experiences to um, recoup what we think is value that might be able to bring in the funds that help us sustain our activities. So I'm just going to talk you through a few of those. And for context, I want to recall my earlier comments about the Division of Continuing Education which at Harvard, like at many other institutions, has long been a way for people to get access to education for a fee that is open. And so we think there are ways that we can partner with, the, um, whether it's our division of continuing education, uh, or whether it's to support efforts within the Harvard schools and provide fee-based options for learners who get uh, um, what the business people call a value-add experience. Maybe there's something further that is available to them building on the baseline of the free experience. Um, one of the most powerful forms of value for students is credit. That's not what we're about at HarvardX, but there are partners within Harvard and elsewhere who might use our materials and our learning experiences as part of their existing credit programs. We are looking at ways to partner with other institutions, whether it's universities or community colleges, um, museums and libraries, where they might license what we have produced, much in the way university libraries license um, academic journals, and in some cases, um, libraries of images and video, that this might be another way that we can um, bring in funds that will help sustain the strategic activities that we're supporting. And then finally, if you think of the marketplace very broadly, not just as something that gives you uh, a check at the end of each month, we're really bringing great value within the schools by providing the platform, the safe space that I mentioned earlier for experimentation, and then allowing the schools to decide how they want to bring those back and integrate them into their practices and to the other activities that they are also pursuing um, as they map their strategic future. And so, all of those things together give us a hint of what we think we might be able to do, but with, with the caveat that this is early days, we all have a lot of the same questions. And um, by virtue of being a strategic initiative that's focused on learning, we're not a product company, so we don't start out identifying a niche in the market that we think we have a place we can sell. So there's, there's a, a creative tension there that we have to live in thinking about what value we can um, gain from the free experiences that will allow us to sustain our work. I just want to um, make a couple of final remarks about Harvard students, and this is a somewhat cobbled together map of the schools around Harvard and um, you can see this is um, our part of Cambridge. That's the Charles River. The business school is across the river. The medical school and the School of Public Health are further into Boston um, in an area called Longwood. And then we have multiple schools around the Harvard Square area. And my apologies to the dental school. I, I, the dental school is attached to the medical school and often doesn't get represented separately here. But um, further on the the thread of benefit to on campus. We are um, pushing very hard working with the partners in the schools on taking the content and materials, focusing on blending, focusing on tools like the annotation tool that I mentioned. We're also working with our library on a new tool um, connected to a Mellon consortium out of Stanford on how very rich images can be integrated from library connections into open online learning experiences as well as on campus courses. Um, looking ahead, we want to focus much more on mobility. Um, my phone is over there. I'm sure all of you have a mobile device. Most of our students are not going to carry these big giant things around, and we'd still love them to have access to what we're doing. 
And um, in the MOOC space, we haven't done much of that yet, although much of the rest of the higher ed sort of materials ecosystem has. Um, a lot more opportunities for um, asynchronous access for our on-campus students and thinking about ways we can remix what we already have. One of the courses I didn't um, tell you about is called Science and Cooking, and it's um, a very popular course in the general education curriculum in, the, in Harvard College where applied mathematician Michael Brenner works with world-renowned chefs to, to explain to students how physical and mathematical principles play out in the kitchen. And um, what we've done for that particular course is take some of the content that we developed for the MOOC and make it available for the students in ebook form so they can use it as reference as they're studying for that class. And then connecting to the many lifelong, uh, lifelong learning opportunities that our alumni groups um, try to foster as a core part of what they do to um, keep our graduates connected to campus throughout their lives, really. So I'd like to pause with that and make sure we have just a little bit of time for questions. But thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the follow-up conversation. Harvard X, there is a specific initiative to keep, to, to stay in touch and also to engage the alumni. Yes. And uh, also, with respect to specific schools, the initiative of Harvard Business School called HBSX HBX. to uh, use HBSX as a funnel for pre-MBA preparation. That's right. Thank you. So, um, as I understood it, Harvard X for alumni and HBX. So I'll start with HBX first. HBX is Harvard Business X. And that is a separate initiative within the business school where they are um, focusing on two very specific market segments, um, pre-MBA or people like me who have liberal arts degrees and no business training. Um, their idea, which um, based on their first pilot seems to have been a very good one, is that they can offer a very targeted curriculum of three foundational business courses they ran their first um, experiment with this over the summer. It's a $1,500 curriculum, very intensive. And they think that, that and, and it's, um, there's no faculty interaction, by the way, in this. It's all um, pre-planned activities, a custom platform, and then um, lots of engagement between the students. And a simulated case study method where the software they've developed um, cold calls them and they have to answer. So HBX is pursuing this very specific vision based on two market areas that they think will have value for them and for their curricula, so pre-MBA. And then the second part that they're doing is called HBX Live, which is basically um, an extraordinary improvement on um, kind of WebEx group experience. So they've invested in technology that allows them to do live courses with case methods um, in much higher quality and in much greater fostering of presence and accountability, almost as if you were in the same room. So we are close um, friends and collaborators, but we have very different scope and very different mission. And I think they will continue along in developing that. And I should just add a, a word about governance. Um, Harvard X is governed by Harvard X faculty committee. We have our faculty director, Robert Liu, chairs that, and we have faculty from the business school who are part of that. So just briefly on Harvard X for alumni, this was the brainchild of our faculty director, and the idea was to use the learning experiences with Harvard X as a way to give alumni a closer connection back to campus and to the faculty. And so we had a pilot of that um, this past year. Over 20,000 alumni signed up for that. And um, we learned from that that the, the alumni are hungry for any way to stay connected back to campus, and what they really 
probably want is somewhere between the full-blown course and then what we did, which was kind of um, bite-size experiences from the course. So we're going to work with the Alumni Association to think of what, what the right kind of experience is for the alumni. So stay tuned. Hello, thank you very much for this really interesting presentation. I'm Bernadette Charlier from Switzerland, I have uh, University of Fribourg. Uh, I have one question, perhaps uh, with, with two sides. Sure. Uh, this question is related to the way you select the new project, the new MOOCs, mm -hmm. because you have said that you, uh, the, the economical uh, framework or model will, e will evolve and uh, uh, there is no way to continue uh, in a real uh, free offer and you, you, you want to add uh, other, other forms, uh, like Spokes or other forms mm -hmm. of uh, courses. So um, could you explain what will be your criteria yes. to, to select the new project if Absolutely. somebody uh, come to you and uh, want, sure. want to, to realize a MOOC? Absolutely, and I, the reason I brought this slide back is because it is tied to um, what you see here. So the process is that um, faculty, from anywhere around Harvard, send us what we call a letter of interest. And we ask them to give us just an initial idea of what they have in mind. And the way we frame that is asking them to think about something that's particularly exciting in a course or a discipline that they want to try to um, pursue in the online setting or a teaching problem that they've had that they think maybe lends itself to this mode. And then our faculty director works with them initially to get the kernel of the idea. And then my team works with them to develop a proposal, and which is then reviewed by the Harvard X faculty committee with members from all across Harvard. And the Harvard X faculty committee really looks at these criteria that you see here at a fairly high level. Um, what is the impact? Is this going to um, contribute something new in the online space and or is it going to bring something of great value back to the residential experience? Is, it going, is there a possibility of actually doing the project? Is it feasible with the resources and tools that we have or that we could create in a reasonable time frame? Um, is it a repeat of something that we're already doing? Does it expand a body of disciplinary knowledge? And um, then that's, that's the high level, impact and quality, disciplinary breadth. And then we also look for experimentation, um, what opportunities might we have in pursuing that project, and is this a project that can go through a, a life cycle with multiple iterations. And the reason that's important is because, um, to quote our faculty director, we don't want to produce this just one time and then put it on the shelf and say, oh, that's so beautiful, I'm very glad we did that. We, we want to do that, yes, but then we want to learn from that and we want to apply what we've learned back into subsequent iterations. And that's a very real constraint for people's time, particularly very busy faculty. So those things come together. Um, the Harvard X team makes recommendations um, based on feasibility and then the faculty committee um, has a discussion that is based on these criteria as well. Um, you talked briefly about the challenge of balancing a decentralized autonomous group of schools with a university-wide strategy. You mentioned, you didn't say attention, but you mentioned the notion of exploring partnerships between continuing ed and, and this initiative. Um, can you talk briefly about, obviously you can't talk about all of them, but some of the strategies you put in place to deal with these challenges, including how you incentivize faculty, if, if you please. Are we out of time yet? No, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> it's, it's probably the, the core question of a strategic initiative, um, particularly at a highly decentralized place like Harvard, which is not unique in its decentralization. Um, I'd say there are at least two strategies. Um, Certainly the presence from the earliest moment of Harvard X's existence of faculty committees with representation and, and engaged representation from across the university has been the foundation of, of 
our success in spanning the, the different schools. And that is actually in the presence of two committees, the Harvard X Faculty Committee, which governs um, the selections of the projects and the basic operations of Harvard X, and an additional faculty committee, the Harvard X Research Committee, that governs um, the overall research priorities and advises on the particular um, studies and uh, collaborations that the research team should pursue. So that in itself, I think, is, is really the most essential part of this. Beyond that, um, sort of in the, in the administrative and executive ranks, there are also analogous groups across Harvard who come together regularly and talk about what our near-term strategy is, what some of the policy questions are that we have to attend to or not, as the case may be. And so without that, we would not have been able to be successful. And so, it, it, But it is a continuous effort. And there are um, issues, you talked about incentives, that have, may have different answers depending on the school. So Harvard X, as a program and an organization, does not offer any incentives to faculty. There's no compensation. There's no release. We leave that to the schools, which have their own strategies and their own approaches that are different um, depending on their particular situation. It's been, um, you can see from the numbers, it, it's been extraordinary, the degree of faculty interest, even in the absence of formal incentives. And there are no signs yet that that interest is going to subside. But it is a key question, and now that we are two years old, it's a question that the faculty are increasingly bringing up, and those conversations are happening within schools.